All right, everyone. So good morning. Uh, thank you all again for being here today. Um, as we continue on with our discussion and series on uh, hamstring rehabilitation, I uh, just want to er, er, uh, emphasize the collaborative nature of uh, these meetings. So feel free to jump in at any point um, or feel free to jot down any points or questions that you have as you go through. Um, Vien is on with us today, so he'll be able to moderate um, a little bit more on the uh, typing. So that should run a little bit smoother this week than last week. Uh, we're really excited today to have uh, um, three speakers total, um, including myself and Kevin McNamara out of uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, he's a sports resident up there. And then Lee Weiss, um, who's the PT and rehabilitation coordinator of the uh, New York football Giants. So it should be a really good presentation today. Um, this is our second uh, lecture in the hamstring series. Um, we're going to be discussing rehabilitation throughout uh, the presentation today. And our next uh, hamstring presentation will be next Friday at 10 o'clock via Zoom. Um, we'll obviously send out the link to the group beforehand um, there. Um, and we'll continue on um, with presenting with hamstrings and discussion of return to play during that time. So we want to acknowledge again um, the article by Lauren Erickson and Mark Sherry, um, which has just served as a great foundation for what we've been presenting on um, throughout this hamstring lecture. And they offer a nice goal here of hamstring strain rehabilitation, and that is to allow the athlete to return to a sport at a level of performance before the injury with minimal risk of reoccurrence for injury. So as we work towards this goal, um, the first thing that we should consider as rehab clinicians is the modifiable risk factors. And for a hamstring injury or strain, these are gonna include hamstring weakness and fatigue, imbalances in the hamstring eccentric and quadricep concentric strength, as well as decreased quadriceps flexibility. Other things that would modify the kinetic chain include reduced hip flexor flexibility, um, strength and coordination impairments, as well as deficits in the pelvic and trunk musculature. So not only do we need to consider these modifiable risk factors, but we also need to account for the psychosocial factors, including fear, apprehension, and also uh, insecurity, which has been reported in the literature. Um, there was a study done by Askling and his colleagues that, or colleagues and showed that 95% of athletes that were about to return to play still demonstrated some feeling of insecurity and that was measured by the H test. And we'll get into that a little bit more next week um, as we uh, discuss that return to play criteria and phases. Um, and for me, it's important to acknowledge all of these factors as we go in and design the rehabilitation. And What are we doing when we go back and plan the rehab? Are we addressing all of these modifiable risk factors, things that are in our sphere of influence? Um, and to detail again a little bit more of the deficits that are seen typically throughout the literature, um, once again, it's just that persistent weakness compared to the uninvolved side or the pre-injury measurements that we typically see. And there's a reduced extensibility of the muscular tendinous unit, and that's due to the presence of scar tissue. And as you can see here in this uh, MRI on this right, you can see that white arrow um, on the left side pointing towards that um, significant scar there. Um, and that's just been seen and reported up to even 23 months post an injury. Um, so that is persistent. That's kind of the new norm for the tissue. Um, if it's a dramatic or um, an intense injury, um, and that's what the presentation will be. And that's why you're going to have a reduced uh, extensibility of the musculotendinous unit. You can also have maladaptive changes in the biomechanics and the motor patterns of the hamstring muscle group. And this made me think about all of the considerations of the hamstring and all the responsibilities it has. So it's a hip extender along with the glutes and that relationship. It's responsibilities in torso and trunk position and returning someone from a bent forward position and also eccentrically lowering the torso. It has the relationship during the swing phase of controlling the knee with the quads and the hams and the reciprocal inhibition that needs to occur with that as well as the implications for pelvis control and core torso stability. So when you really consider all these responsibilities of the hamstrings, you understand how complex these rehabilitations can be and all these facets that we need to consider. Some specific deficits that are seen in the literature include um, a study demonstrating that a sporting population had a 9.6% deficit 
and peak torque and a 6.4% deficit in total work and demonstrated um, from isokinetic testing. And this was done at return to sport. Um, so they were seeing, even though these athletes subjectively and objectively were looking like they could return to sport, they were seeing these deficits um, compared to their uninvolved side. Um, and you can see here this graph on the right, I tried to draw these arrows to make this a little bit easier to digest, but this is from the same study that demonstrated those deficits at return to sport. They did a six month follow up and what they found was that at six months, so that'd be this top line here, this isokinetic curve comparing torque and knee flexion angle. They were finding that at six months from the time of return to sport, so six months after that time to return to sport, they brought them back in and they were finding that these athletes had an increase in peak torque um, as well as a shift in the angle of peak torque. And so this demonstrates that even though these athletes were returning to sport, they still had a capacity for an increase in strength. So I think that yields the question, are we pushing our athletes enough to really gain back those strengths and what is obtainable? Um, it is also demonstrated that there is a decrease in eccentric flexor torque of the hamstring towards that lengthen range. And that's typically going to be in a five to 25 degree range. And that's, that for me has a lot of implications because that's when we need the hamstrings to act eccentrically and forcefully and to be able to slow down that lower limb in the swing phase. And that can be particularly troublesome. I did cut a few things just due for the sake of time and having three presenters today, but it is worth mentioning that there is this typical decrease in the angle of peak torque. So basically the muscle's strongest point post hamstring injury is gonna be in a shorter knee flexion range of motion, which is troublesome because once again, we need that to be stronger in a lengthened state in our, in our sporting movements. So that's something to consider as well as to really emphasize an eccentric program, but make sure you're emphasizing in a lengthened state to account for that shift in this angle of peak torque. So now we've gone through some of the deficits, I want to just introduce a basic physiology just so we understand what we're looking to adjunct or try to progress um, from a histiological standpoint. We start by discussion of the classification of hamstring injuries, and there's numerous ways to classify this. Um, some people, you know, can say with the location or the size of the hematoma, it's usually um, the pathophysiology results in basically a fire door mechanism where the hematoma can be confined to one uh, minor fibro, fire, fiber or smaller muscular area, but sometimes those grade threes where it is truly across the entire muscle belly, um, that's gonna be a more of an intramuscular tearing of the epimysium, so that hematoma is gonna be more diffuse. There is some debate um, if delayed onset muscle soreness is part of the spectrum. Um, histologically speaking, in DOMS, what they do find is there's an increase in creatine kinase, which is an inflammatory signal and marker, um, as well as some shearing and maybe disruption of this um, sarcolemma. Um, so for myself, that's more of just kind of a histological change, not truly a disruption of the Meyer fiber. So I don't think I would consider DOMS part of um, hamstring injury spectrum. Um, we're all pretty familiar, I'm sure, with the grading of mild through severe, one, two, three, and that basically looks at the amount of fibers that are torn, um, progressing all the way from minimal um, to of a few muscle fibers in a grade one, all the way to the severity of grade three, where that's going to be the entire cross section. Um, there's other classifications based on location of tissue that are affected. Um, however, this and so that's looking at the, you know, the um, proximal tendon, or is it intermuscular? Where is it? What's the length of it? And this, I think, goes back to our conversation last week that uh, Chris the Willie kind of brought up from the UW, or from UW, um, just explaining that there is truly a lack of um, prognostic value in looking just solely at an MRI. And they've, they've seen over and over in the literature just hamstring injuries that look the same on MRI um, continue to basically heal at different weight rates and can be caused from completely different mechanisms. So it just kind of brings up that classification while it's maybe an important factor, it isn't the only factor. So what actually occurs when we have a hamstring injury? And so you're going to have rupturing of several vessels, including myofibers, of the basal lamina, 
mysal sheets as well as blood vessels running into the endo or paramyceum. This picture here on the right is a cross-section area of those myofibers, as well as this P here showing that mysal sheath here, that perimyceum, and this would be a uh, longitudinal view of the myofiber. So to, dis to describe what the cycles look like, the first phase is gonna be that destruction phase. And the ruptured myofiber becomes necrotized um, for a short distance, and it's kind of that fire door mechanism, or like I think of the Titanic as well, um, where it's just sealing that hematoma in um, via this uh, new sarcolemma that's starting to form. You can see that in the second picture here. The ruptured fibers are gonna contract, and the gap is then filled by hematoma. Um, and this is where the inflammatory cell reaction starts to occur as well. In the second phase, the repair phase, you're going to start to have uh, phagocytosis of the necrotized tissue. The myogenic reserve cells or satellite cells are going to start to differentiate and start to uh, repair the, beach, the breached myofiber. Um, these myoblasts that arise from the satellite cells start to fuse to form the myotubules in a couple of days. So this is a really well done schematic of a minor trauma. Um, typically we would see more of a cross-section disruption, but I thought the differentiation of the satellite cells was really done in this video, so I want to just include it here. And you can see here this green uh, structure. Uh, it's going to be the satellite cells. Damage to the muscle fiber, nearby quiescent muscle stem cells are prompted to activate and dislodge from their reach. After cell division, the resulting proliferative cells differentiate, then fuse with the damaged myofiber and restore its integrity. And you can see there that fusion that's occurring. Um, satellite cells are important. And uh, if any of you uh, attended Johnny Owen's talk, that's, I believe, what they're looking a lot more into the BFR um, realm that um, satellite cells seem to be stimulated um, through BFR. And that might be part of the reason that you're seeing those strength gains um, with using that intervention. Um, so within five to six days, then the necrotized part of the ruptured myofiber is then replaced by the regenerative myofiber, um, which starts to penetrate and thin connective tissue scar, and that's better seen. And then also you start to have some revascularization and angiogenesis going on. So you can see here from this picture that top, those satellite cells, those kind of like egg yoking looking cells start to differentiate and it's a myoblast and fibroblast begin to produce collagen and form that scar tissue. In the bottom, those myoblasts differentiate into myotubules and start to connect those stumps or the ruptured myofiber together. In the final stage of remodeling, um, this is the period of maturation where one contractile apparatus will be formed. Um, the retraction of the scar starts to pull the ends closer together um, and they stay separated basically by that thin layer of connective tissue to which the ends are then connected to and that forms those new uh, muscular tendon junctions. So what does this all mean for the acute care of hamstring injury? And it basically validates um, in a lot of the studies that have been done, they truly have only been done in rat studies, but it shows that a short period of immobilization is warranted in these cases. Um, it, it, typically results in better terms of prognosis in terms of speed of recovery, as well as overall the integrity of the outcome. Um, and that's gonna allow the uh, loose connective tissue to gain that required strength to withstand that contraction um, from forces through the muscle. Typically, immobilization should, less, you know, should uh, last less than a week, um, and it should start very gradually, be relatively pain-free, more dull than sharp, um, which we'll talk about in a few slides here. And that's going to accelerate some of the markers that are going to help, like the satellite cells, to regenerate, as well as the angiogenesis in this area that's going to stimulate the healing cycle. So it's, it's truly a balance, and it truly comes down to clinical decision-making. Um, it'll also uh, allow for correct orientation of those regenerating muscle fibers as well as scar tissue. So how do we do this? Um, and it's, it's old school rice. And as Dan Lorenz says, icing isn't cool anymore, but it's something that I think the literature is still pointing to being effective in these. Um, so first component is obviously rice or immobilization. 
Um, you can prevent that further retraction of the, rust, or the uh, ruptured muscle stumps, and this can be accomplished via crutches, wraps, or braces. I think for myself, my go-to is like a reverse hip spica, as you can see here in this picture. Um, the X going over kind of the ischial tuberosity area, and it's just going to pull that limb into extension, prevent that lengthening of the hamstring group. Um, if it's a really um, severe case, you may be wrapping the knee as well to really protect that and really offloading the you know, braces. But I think most of the cases that I see are the grade twos, that's going to be more um, typically uh, done through like an ACE wrap. Um, so cryotherapy is associated with a significantly smaller hematoma um, and that can help uh, healing of the ruptured myofiber stumps and also less tissue inflammation. Um, it's recommended and it's seen in the literature that six hours on and off, so this might be night of the injury um, to try to um, continue, but that's something where I'd maybe have an athlete just fall asleep with ice on it versus like having them stay up for six hours. They need the rest uh, post game as well. Elevation and compression components, those seem, seem to be more anecdotal and there's mixed evidence for those use um, in treatment of these. I did want to introduce this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that I came across just based on our discussion last week. Um, it's a question that I went and posed to a few of my uh, sports medicine colleagues down here to uh, ask them what their opinion was of it as well. Um, in the use of NSAIDs, um, it's a balance because on one hand, you want to control that inflammatory response to avoid secondary injury to tissues that are surrounding the uh, strain. But at the same time, elimination of some of those cellular signals and the receptors can impair that uh, functional recovery of the injured muscles. And NSAIDs also do have sometimes some secondary side effects on the GI tract, so you have to weigh that in your equation as well. Um, and you can also suppress that satellite cell or myoblast number um, after the injury, which could potentially have detrimental effects on that regeneration. Um, so the systematic review went and examined acute muscle injury um, assessed by strength loss, soreness, or blood uh, creatinine and kinase levels. And what they found, um, as you can see from these T-plots, the one on the top left being strength loss, top uh, right being the uh, soreness, and the bottom being the CK levels. Overall, they did have a clinical significance in um, using NSAIDs in that three to five day uh, post-injury period, um, and it leaned in towards more towards uh, improving strength, soreness, and the inflammatory markers. So what is the clinical significance of all this information? Um, and from the Erickson protocol, which is a really great thorough protocol, um, we can see some of the exercises that you might be implementing in these zero to four weeks. Um, and so I bolded the ones that I think I'm usually apt to go to in the first week, um, some low to moderate intensity, um, obviously low intensity sidestepping. Um, and this for me is taking them out of the sagittal, or the sagittal plane, um, so really not flexing or extending the hamstring muscle too much, but starting to get some load through the limb and just give them some confidence through that. Um, a prone abdominal bridge or plank, um, Kevin's going to discuss why neuromuscular control of the torso is very important, um, but this is just kind of getting them along in that cycle. Um, or and also a supine extension bridge. And for me, this is like a net isometric contraction. Um, it's a good way to stimulate the lower extremity while protecting that hamstring um, as they go through this kind of first acute phase here. And then these are some of my personal suggestions, um, things that I've done in the past that have worked well. Um, Doing like a slide board or heel drag, um, this wouldn't be something I'd be doing in a lengthened state, um, but I think it just, it's an easy way to start to have some type of contraction and isotonic, or when they're um, overcoming that gravity, it's kind of a net isometric contraction. It gives them a lot of control. They're seated there, they control it, they, they go at their own pace, um, and increases their locus of control, which is the reason I like that. A few other things, just a simple walkout exercise from a supine line, just once again, trying to get some lengthening. Um, and I really tried to uh, be careful with my phrasing of this next one, but just potentially even doing like a Nordic lean. So having them in a tall kneeling position, but really driving through the upper extremity, um, doing like a wall push up motion, um, just to get them prepared to um, be moving in that Nordic position that um, is gonna be essential to their eccentric loading as we'll discuss here in a little bit further. And some other things, just moving from a 
pull to a tall kneeling position as well as some wall squats. Wall squats obviously not being in like a deep hip flexion or knee range motion. And just kind of loading up some of those quads iso, um, isometrically um, just to get some muscle um, activation going through the lower extremity. And I think the most important thing is to emphasize it's not just about the type of exercise. Um, there's a lot of things that we can modify, just not which exercises they're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be just a blank statement of these are all the exercises we need to get to. I think it's really important in this space to figure out what's working for your athlete, um, what's making them sore, are they having sharp pain with isometric activation? Well, so let's go and try to perform some isotonic activation and some eccentric loading perhaps. Um, it, it, these presentation of these er, um, injuries really vary. So I think for us, as rehab professionals, it's really going in and figuring out what works best for them and try to accomplish something, give them something in their lotus of control, as little as it might be, like look for the small victories every day. Um, and through this continuum to monitor rate of perceived exertion, pain intensity, the type of pain they're having and the residual effects from this. Um, but obviously not too much because we don't wanna have any of those fear avoidance behaviors uh, occurring. So with that, I um, want to move on to the first discussion section. So uh, my first question is, uh, does anybody have any thoughts on what things they go to with bracing, strapping, or offloading during the first 10 days, um, things that they've had success with at all? Ryan, this is Anne Marie. Hey, Anne Marie. Can you hear me? I'm sorry I came in late. We our COVID meeting went late. Um, so in the first seven to ten days, um, something that I've used is kinesio tape, um, starting proximally a little bit above the shield tuberosity and going a strip down each, like the medial and the lateral side, just to give them some support, like even just sometimes getting from sitting to standing can be painful. So that just helps kind of pull those um, structures towards the proximal area so they're not getting too much lengthening and pulling on those areas that's trying to heal. Yeah, and something just serving as like a kinesthetic reminder of they, they don't want to really be lengthening through that tissue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else, does anybody typically brace over maybe doing the ace wrap with kinesio tape. They just want to be more aggressive with that or does it truly kind of vary which grade you're at? So at, I was helping out the University of Delaware in the training room and what we do is we put them in a knee immobilizer and then we put a foam pad right over the hamstring injury and then we brace them right after it happens after the game and then we leave it in for about 24 hours. And that's something that they got from the Kilgorn article mm -hmm. um, that it, we've seen pretty good. Um, we've seen it work with a lot of the athletes and it seems to work pretty good. Yeah. And do, do you, um, do you guys limit hip flexion in any way through that? Or is it just strictly that knee T brace there? It's just a knee. We don't limit um, hip flexion yeah. too, too much. I mean, the brace is going to do some of that. Mm -hmm. They still need to be able to walk and do some of their ADLs. Yeah, and I, I think it gets back to not just having one thing. We've got all these tools to use and, you know, bracing, kinesio tape, um, hip flexor wrap, it's just things to uh, be able to go ahead and uh, utilize um, through this and just kind of fitting what your athlete's presenting like. Um, so the second question that I have here then is the, uh, what are your go-to exercises, volume techniques in the first seven to 10 days of injury, anything that you thought could be added to the protocol, um, that Erickson presented or anything else that you might have? Hey, Ryan, nice job. Um, I think you did a really good job of the, on the week zero to four slide talking about this concept that. You can have the same exercise, but just vary the tempo, um, range of motion. I think that's important. Um, so I just want to point that out, and that's what I kind of go to. I don't get too fancy with it. I just stick with um, glute hamstring exercises that kind of vary those principles or variables. Yeah. Fitting the rehab to their presentation and feeling comfortable, I think, enough to like move out of things.
right. So with that, so I'll, um, I'll throw in a, a couple yeah. of basic exercises that, um, I mean, they're not sexy at all, but they're still, they're still valuable. Um, there's something with just basic, uh, quick isometrics in a pain-free intensity, um, you know, both just muscle activation, but also a muscle pumping effect. Um, and then I like to do a lot of like co-contraction type exercises in that first week. So things like just a squat, step up, step down, lunges, um, you know, a leg press or a shuttle press, um, all pain-free intensities, pain-free weight, but something that just, all right, the hamstrings are working, but you're not going to cause any re-injury. Yeah. It's almost having that, like, that isometric effect. Right. And then, I mean, based on the Askling stuff and the, the Mark Sherry stuff, I mean, now you get to throw in, um, you know, I'm looking at the, the appendix here in the Erickson article. So doing the side shuffling and karaoke, doing the, the single leg stance and the, the core stuff. So all of a sudden, I, I think you see a, a really large volume of treatment exercises in that first week where traditionally people probably like think less is more. But there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff we can do early on. Nas, were you gonna jump in there? Yeah, I was also just gonna. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of movement early, as in tolerable, comfortable movement, such as even like cyclical biking. But the other big thing that we use early on, and this is made of, we feel like uh, from a you know. Uh, I don't know if I'm an expert opinion, but I have an opinion uh, level, but we've been using uh, the BFR uh, cell swelling protocols a lot in these early stage muscle injuries uh, and have been having really good results with it. So I, and, and I know Johnny Owens, I've talked to him about this a while um, and, and he's seen it across the country as well for some of these muscle injuries. And so I just want to throw that out there. Some of the early, early stuff we do for these. Yeah, I think BFR is going to continue to be huge for loading when you can't necessarily load because you don't want to have that sheer force as we, we discussed here. Um, it's just a good intervention to, or way to provide that histiological fatigue without having that sheer force um, or tearing force. Cool. Um, so we're going to shoot this over to uh, Kevin McNamara for the second uh, part of the presentation. Uh, let me... Let me figure out Vian. Vian's kind of more of a technologically inclined guy than I am. Um, I'm going to pause my share. What's up? How do I shoot this over to him? Uh, yeah, you unshare and then uh, Lee's going next or Kevin? It's Kevin. Yeah, so Kevin, after you unshare, Kevin should share. Kevin, are you able to screen grab there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't know if I see your slides though. Uh, I cannot share right now. It says host is disabled screen sharing. Okay, let me. Might have to pause. All right, I think we're good. Sweet. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. You can go ahead. Kevin, I think we're good. You can start. All right. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. All right, perfect. Well, so first of all, I just want to say thank you again to Ryan and Vian for sort of putting this initiative together and, you know, allowing me to, to contribute this week. And, um, you know, this is certainly something that I've gotten a lot out of, and I think it's been very beneficial. So hopefully I'll continue to contribute positively to this. And essentially what I wanted to do was just kind of take a little bit of like a 10,000 foot view as kind of how we kind of navigate the, the rehabilitation process moving from sort of the early phase as Ryan touched on into kind of return to sport and even those those subacute phases and, and sort of beyond so how are we kind of reconditioning the injured athlete 
And, you know, I, I wanted to kind of reinforce what Ryan stated initially is that, you know, I very much want this to be uh, an open dialogue and discussion. Um, none of this information is, is proprietary to me. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to learn from and, and interact with people that are much more knowledgeable than myself. And, and many of you are included on this call. So by all means, please, if you have a, you know, a point where you think it'd be a good time to stop and discuss, if you want to tell me where you think I'm going wrong or anything like that, um, please feel free to do so, okay? So I think one way we can kind of start to look at this is maybe taking a step back and just get an understanding of, of what do we want to be able to actually accomplish when we're talking about a training or, or rehabilitation process. And I think the simplest way to kind of think about this is essentially we just want to sort of manipulate the environment to drive some sort of specific adaptation, right? And this is essentially done through the controlled application of stress. And I think that three sort of variables that we want to keep in mind when we're talking about rehabilitation or training is, is maximizing system variability, which is just the range of options that this person is able to, to access or the number of strategies that they're able to, to implement to complete their goal task. I would say maximizing system capacity is another one or the amount of total work that the person is able to, to accomplish or perform. And then the last one, which would be system power, which is the intensity at which that person is able to perform at. So I think this kind of leads us into this idea of the rehabilitation to performance continuum. Now, I think it was George Box who had the quote that, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think that that definitely applies to the realm of, you know, physical therapy and physical preparation. Um, we know that the complex human system does not behave in this very neat sort of phase-like manner, but I still think having some sort of, of guiding principle or heuristic to, to kind of navigate the process and aid in decision-making is useful for us. So as we kind of move into kind of phase one here, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I think Ryan did an excellent job in kind of covering the acute early management portion of this really diving into some of the basic science aspect side of things. But I think I would reinforce here that, you know, joint position is going to be crucial, right? That's a fundamental thing that we need to make sure that we're achieving um, and really just making sure that we're doing our due diligence in the early phases of rehabilitation to promote an environment that's going to be optimal for healing, right? So just ensuring that as we move into some of the later stages and get back to higher intensity demands, you know, like sprinting or, or allowing this person to return to their sport, we need to make sure that we've done our, our good job in the early phases here uh, to make that successful. So as we move into sort of the second phase here, I think motor skill and neuromuscular control, which I kind of think about as just establishing competency in some of the basic patterns that this person may have had issues with because they had a soft tissue injury or some sort of insult to uh, areas that are going to be required to, to perform as we move along is important. So this is an area where we're maybe transitioning from some of the more isometric based contractions or some of the lower intensity loading things early on. And, and I would emphasize that, you know, it's going to be probably lower intensity because as Ryan detailed in some of the early aspects of healing, we want to be aware of kind of where this person's at in the healing process. If they are kind of in that proliferative phase of healing, we don't necessarily want to be be blasting them with too much intensity or any sort of super maximal loads. But I do kind of want to stop here and just kind of open it up to everybody here and, and get an understanding or open it up for discussion as to when exactly are you guys looking to implement some higher load eccentrics? Because if we go to the literature, we see things like uh, you know, Carl Askling and his protocol where we're moving into sort of longer length eccentric loadings as early as five days post-op. You know, there was an article from Hickey talking about pain-free versus painful thresholds of loading where they were starting to implement some longer range eccentrics as early as three days. So I'll just kind of pause here and just kind of throw it up to everybody before we kind of move into addressing some of the potential neuromuscular aspects here. Um, how early are you guys looking to implement some eccentric loading um, is this something that you're following more of like a criterion based, which I think the literature would say is generally a better way to go versus time based. But what's it kind of look like for you guys in terms of how early are we starting to load, load these end range positions?
Hey, Kevin. So um, I think maybe the Delaware group, mainly Daniel, might have a good response to this too. But um, there was a Hickey article in 2019 that came out talking about pain threshold versus pain preloading. And I think um, when people think about essentials, they think about like Nordics. But I think you can even do a bridge just focusing on um, the tempo more than anything, not even eccentrics. But um, I usually start with some kind of isometric and then work on tempo. And then if they can, can handle higher loads for um, the eccentric portion, I'll do that. Uh, but largely with the symptoms, uh, I know that article mentioned that in the, if you just read the conclusion, it says that pain threshold is better. So training up to four out of 10. Um, but looking at the results, it, it wasn't significant at all. So I'm usually gonna go with uh, loading as tolerated. I'm okay if they hit a little bit of pain, but I'm not gonna, my goal isn't for them to hit that four out of 10 to consider that a successful rehab session. Yeah, I think um, what I try and do is I try and load them as quickly as possible and try and do eccentrics as quick as I can. Um, it doesn't have to be through the full range. If they do have pain, like Vin was saying, like that's perfectly okay. Um, I'm not trying to push them to like a six out of 10, but I think there's no reason if to not do eccentrics because you want to load them and you want to try and get into that as quick as possible. Um, even if it's at a modified range. So if they can tolerate, tolerate it, then I just go right to eccentrics and just kind of skip isometrics altogether. But I do like that Hickey article in the fact that, um, just saying that it's okay to have pain because the other part of this is we want to make sure that they're psychologically ready. And if the second that they get pain, we're stopping all exercise, then that could reinforce the idea that, okay, all pain is bad. Um, anytime I feel something when I'm running or when I'm trying to get back to sport, then um, I, I see, they view that as a bad thing. Whereas it's just part of the rehabilitation process. Like we know they're going to have pain until they're 100% ready. So I really try and do that as quick as possible. Yeah, excellent. I think I, I would agree with you guys for sure. It's certainly not something where we necessarily need to be too fearful, I think, of, of necessarily loading some of those end range positions because we do know we need to prepare them for that. Um, so thanks to everybody for the con contribution there. So kind of moving along here into looking at some potential neuromuscular control deficits. This is something that I thought the Erickson article took a good amount of time to actually kind of detail. And I think there's probably decent evidence and, and reasons behind this. So if we just kind of look at the general reoccurrence rates or hamstring injuries are you know, notoriously recalcitrant in nature. And I think with some additional information, looking from some older studies at just general activation and deficits in force production between eccentric versus concentric aspects, you know, it could be suggested that there is an element of, of neuromuscular inhibition here. And we've also seen here that earlier onset of hamstring muscles during the transition from double to single leg um, in those with previous hamstring muscle injury compared to those without suggests that there could be some sort of element of, of motor control or neuromuscular control uh, deficits happening here. So as we kind of move into this here, I think looking at it from like a lumbopelvic aspect and these kind of two, two kind of sectors here, looking at the role of the hip and the pelvis and then the trunk and the glutes, I found it was pretty interesting. Now, this is something I wouldn't necessarily say is really strong evidence, but we did see in a, in a case control study, um, I believe it was by Daly et al., that we noticed that postures assumed during running and sprinting in those with previous hamstring injury demonstrated increased lordosis, more hip flexion, and more femoral internal rotation, which is a good way to put maximum stretch on the long head of that biceps femoris, which we know tends to be the victim in a majority of these, these hamstring muscle injuries. And I think increasing hip flexion and, and the ability to generate force horizontally, those are key elements in achieving top end velocity and, and maximizing energy efficient sprint mechanics. So I think collectively, when we look at this, this could be an indication where we maybe have a role for implementing some some lower intensity running specific drills. Um, now, I don't necessarily know that there's going to be a lot of transference in some of that, but I do think it's an area where maybe even introducing something like some, some incline running or, or uphill running to really prioritize front side mechanics while trying to minimize some of the eccentric 
loads or stress through the hamstring is a good opportunity to maybe work on some of these neuromuscular control deficits. And then as we kind of look at programs that emphasize this core stability, um, as we talk about here in the next slide, we'll get into kind of the, the early research from Sherry and Best on their PATS program. Now there is some some issues that I have with this study, but we did notice that they had a decreased rate of re-injury and an earlier return to sport and that in those programs that did emphasize some element of core stability. So just something to keep in mind as we kind of move forward here. Um, but I think overall considerations for trunk and pelvic position is we can look at this as more of an idea of where we can possibly manipulate variables to control stress and loading. So I would say that Yes, the type and the speed of contraction are going to be probably the biggest things that we're changing or manipulating throughout the rehabilitation process, but the position of the trunk and pelvis is going to be important too, right? So if we think about forces going through uh, the muscles of interest here, a bilateral hip symmetrical position, which would be something that we'd see in a Nordis or a Nordic, excuse me, or even like a double leg uh, RDL, it's going to have vastly different torques going through the pelvis as opposed to more of a split hip position. So just an idea here to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about progressions throughout the rehabilitation process, being mindful of trunk position and the position that the pelvis is in uh, is another way that we can kind of look to, to load pertinent tissues and progress throughout the rehabilitation process. So as we kind of move into phase three here, we're looking to emphasize kind of biomotor development. Um, this is where we're really getting after it in the rehabilitation process. So we're progressing range of motion, uh, we're manipulating contraction type, we're manipulating velocities and loading. You know, this is probably a place in rehab where we're starting to initiate uh, higher intensity hip dominant stuff to prioritize some of the more proximal musculature, maybe in also including, you know, knee dominant exercises to more of the distal parts of the hamstring. Uh, we're really trying to emphasize force production and force absorption here. Maybe we're introducing a little bit of elasticity. Uh, and then I think this is where we can really start to get into some of those super maximal uh, eccentric movements. So we know that's going to be a, a crucial component to, to achieving top end running velocity. And we've also seen in a lot of great work from Ryan Timmons and David Opar's group, uh, that eccentric strength deficits and, and asymmetry side to side is, is certainly associated with an increased risk. Um, this is where we get into the discussion on Nordics, right? It, it tends to be an area of contention, I suppose. Uh, I'm not really sure why. If we do kind of look into the literature, um, can't really argue with the data. And, you know, the most recent systematic review that I pulled up from Van Dyke, um, you know, we're seeing that if you include the Nordics, you're essentially having uh, the number of hamstring muscle injuries that your team's going to, to incur. So I think... The other thing we can talk about in this study that I really liked was the fact that they did a sensitivity analysis, which allows us to be a little bit more confident in some of their findings. Um, a lot of times some of the blowback on systematic reviews is it's only as good as the, as the data that goes in. But I think the fact that they've done that sensitivity analysis, we have a large body of evidence showing the efficacy of the Nordic program. In my mind, there, there's no real reason not to implement them throughout the rehabilitation process. So this kind of brings us into this discussion, particularly put forward in the Erickson article about types of rehabilitation programs. So this is where we talk a little bit about the, the progressive agility and trunk stability, uh, that famous study by, by Sherry and Best in 2004. Um, now the interesting thing here is they talk about trunk stability, but if you look at some of the details and the methodology within that study, they actually didn't have a variable to, to kind of monitor or, or assess trunk stability. Um, and some of the exercises that we're implementing throughout that protocol, they, they were prioritizing end range eccentric strength and, and lengthening. So it kind of gets into this idea of, you know, operational definitions are going to be important for kind of the critical thinking and reasoning aspect here. So is that really a, a trunk stability exercise or is it considered more of a, an eccentric lengthening exercise? It probably depends on who you ask. Um, but I think, the overall takeaway, especially as we look at the data from Carl Askling's group, where we've seen the L protocol performing much superior to the C protocol. Uh, and essentially what those were was the L protocol was emphasizing or prioritizing longer lengths, uh, controlled eccentric loading. This is kind of the classic glider, diver, slider exercises that we're all probably familiar with. And that certainly outperformed the C protocol, which was much more of an emphasis on shorter muscle lengths, um, 
more isometric based contractions. And what we see is that including long length eccentric exercises is going to be beneficial in the return to sport process. Uh, significant time in return to sport. Uh, we're looking at, at the soccer world here, 28 days with no re-injuries in the L protocol versus 51 and one re-injury uh, in the C protocol. As we move into more sagittal based stuff like sprinters, uh, 49 days to return to sport for the L protocol versus 86 days to return to sport for the C protocol. So I think collectively what this kind of states is that, you know, we have a variety of rehabilitation processes that have been shown to work, but the common, the common element through all of them is progressively loading through longer ranges of motion. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for me. Um, you know, my bias is certainly more directed toward utilizing eccentrics to kind of address structure, uh, morphology and architecture, and then a, a properly periodized sprint progression to kind of maximize transference and specific tissue loading. But I do think there's probably enough here um, in the literature to suggest that having some sort of element or at least being mindful of the influence of, you know, trunk and, and lower extremity kinematics is probably something to be considered uh, throughout the rehabilitation process and, and at least make up a certain element of your program. So as we kind of move towards the later stages here, getting into work capacity and specific endurance, you know, this is where we really start to get into some of the, some of the, the later stage stuff in regards to how do we get this person back to, to the thing that they actually need to do. And I think that this comes down to a couple questions. We kind of probably need to know what they are dealing with in terms of what's the amount of time that they're spending at top velocity? What's the total distance that they're covering? Is, is there positional elements that need to be considered here? Obviously a goalkeeper is not going to be spending as much time at top velocities or distances as, you know, a midfielder or something like that. If we're talking more field sports. Uh, and then the last thing I, I kind of want to throw to everybody is what are you using to assess when this person is kind of ready to start to implement some of these uh, return to sprint protocols? You know, the one on the right here is from Hickey. Um, you know, Dan Lorenz, we're fortunate enough to have him on the call. He recently just put out a great return to sprinting clinical commentary. Uh, so what are your, some of your benchmarks that you guys are using to gauge readiness to, to kind of get this person into some of this later stage return to sprinting? Um, and, and what have you been found success with in terms of establishing a good benchmark or sort of uh, exit criteria to to kind of gauge when this person is ready to start implementing some of this higher velocity work. Are you asking me specifically, Kevin? Or I'm sorry, I didn't know if that was a question. Yeah, who, whoever. If, if you, I, Dan, I know that you kind of mentioned that you were looking at like, uh, you know, you were, I think it was seventy percent on a on a single limb hop per distance, correct? Well, and the isolated like handle dynamometer testing too. Right. Um, but that was also more, I mean, more tailored for post op, you know, ACLs, meniscus repairs, cartilage restoration procedures, things like that. It probably still applies in this case. Um, I'm typically, but prior to doing all that stuff, I'm doing a lot of A skips, B skips, um, um, a lot of sprint mechanics stuff. So, um, it's hard to talk about these things without showing them. <laughs> well, that kind of leads me into my next slide here, right? So a little bit of transparency just in terms of kind of what, what this might look like, right? In terms of how do we get somebody back to kind of like that top end sprinting here? And there they are right there, you know, the a, a march, a skip, a run. Essentially, we're just kind of manipulating variables or uh, <clears throat> amplitude, right? So seeing if they can tolerate an a march, moving into an a skip, into an a run, and then just gradually kind of layering on <clears throat> distance and volume. So just kind of an idea here of how to progress this. This is something that I just kind of came up with here. Um, certainly by no means the end all be all, but just general sort of gradually increasing intensity and in, of loading and and exposing that person to kind of top end demand so I think playing around with amplitude moving from a march to a skip you can even mess around with something like a tall start to a deep start uh, and then gradually building in acceleration distances um, and layering in volume is something that I think is, is is probably a good way to go in terms of just assessing readiness and gradually exposing them to increasing demands um, 
just another kind of visual here, just to kind of look at what we may be going to to kind of gauge this process. You know, starting out with you know neuromuscular control, establishing movement competency, making sure this person has the local tissue capacity to handle it, adding in some external loading, again playing around with amplitude from marching to skipping, some sort of plyometric activity, technical skips, acceleration mechanics, and then progressively overloading, uh, increase, increasing acceleration distances, total time spent at top end velocity, et cetera. So I think to kind of summarize here before we throw it to Lee, who I know is going to get into a little bit more detail on, on what his, some, some uh, the specifics of his rehabilitation is. And he's certainly probably forgot more about hamstring rehab than I know, but I think a couple of things we can touch on that, that Ryan mentioned, uh, you know, known risk factors is shorter fascicle length. We see de deficits or decrements in eccentric strength, decreased re repeat sprint ability. Uh, the other thing, you know, workload management is another thing to keep in mind here. I believe it was Tony Shield who has shown that there tends to be like about a two week lag time in terms of exposures to uh, top end sprinting and, and the occurrence of a hamstring injury. So, so something to keep in mind right there. And I think, you know, in terms of actionable steps that we can kind of take is, is don't delay too long. Uh, there was a review by Bayer in 2017 that showed, I think, that er if you started rehabilitation earlier, um, like within the three-day mark, as opposed to like the, the seven or the nine-day mark, there was a difference in about three weeks in return to play. So something to keep in mind. I think the other thing is, you know, get them strong. Once they're strong, keep them symmetrical. Nordics. They work should probably be making up some sort of component of your rehabilitation program. Being aware and mindful of lower extremity and trunk kinematics. And then I think the last one is we need to get them back to what they're going to be exposed to in a game scenario. So try and get them running early and then get them running often to make sure that they're able to handle those imposed demands. That was awesome, Kevin. Thank you. Um, and I think if you could just end your share, and then I think Lee, you should be able to grab um, and share your screen. I made you a co-host as well. There we go. Good morning. Can can everybody see my screen? Looks great. Awesome. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. I thought the um, the first two presentations were awesome and and you know cover a lot of what what I what, what I intended to cover. All great information. Um, so I wanted to just give a little insight about um, how we approach hamstrings uh, with with the Giants. Um, I sit on the the NFL's lower extremity soft tissue injury task force. Uh, you know, we, we see over 800 hamstring strains a year across the NFL. It's got a huge injury burden, um, which means, you know, there's, there's a lot of them multiplied by the times and the days they miss, uh, actually only second to ACL injuries in, in regards to days missed. So it's a big problem around the league, and it's something we're really trying to capture. We think a lot of these injuries are preventable. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously through secondary prevention, uh, hopefully try to bring down some of the recurrence rates as well. I'm trying to advance this. Okay, so obviously, and this has been mentioned, the goal of rehabilitation is really to get the athlete to return to pre-injury level, and, and obviously you want to minimize the risk of recurrence, which is really high uh, with these type of injuries. Um, I, I think Ryan and Kevin alluded to, you know, addressing the modifiable risk factors, muscle weakness and balances, mobility and flexibility concerns. We know that um, there's nothing in the rehabilitation process that says you can't make them a better athlete when they get back. Um, and that's something we kind of always strive to do. And, and obviously looking at this as a continuum versus a single event is ideal in our situations. So these are kind of what I, what I consider the eight principles of, of hamstring strain rehabilitation, at least in my eyes. Um, and we'll kind of go through each one of these uh, in a little more detail. So I think as Kevin uh, addressed really nicely, um, you know, we try to address the kinetic chain first. We know that based on the attachment of the hamstring to the pelvis, um, there's a large, uh, you know, impact of um, hamstring strains and how it relates to the pelvis and hip kinematics. 
uh, based on the muscle attachment. So uh, the Sherry Investor article obviously promoting core stability rehabilitation uh, resulted in earlier return to sport and lower recurrence rate is something we really stand by. Um, with that being said, though, when we talk about core stability, we don't look at abdominal crunches and, and a lot of uh, flexion exercises. We think a lot of our, our players are already flexed and have tight hip flexors, um, you know, from sitting in meetings all day, from sitting at home on their couch, from, uh, you know, being in a crouch position on the field. So we tend to focus more on those core stability exercises in the neutral pelvis. So whether it's a plank series or, um, you know, if we do some anti-rotation, anti-flexion, anti-extension type exercises. So we talk about core stability, we really go, go in that regard. Um, we know that reductions in hip flexion uh, can cause an anterior uh, pelvic tilt. And we know that this uh, apparent motion uh, creating the anterior pelvic tilt can contribute to deficits in force production um, and, and hamstring strain and hamstring length and, and faulty length tension relationships. So really tend to focus on uh, restoring hip flexion, uh, doing some psoas work, uh, you know, stretching the anterior hip capsule, um, and really doing some super band type of, sort of hip exercises to really open up uh, the front of the hip. Uh, hip flexion is, is very important uh, in the individual's ability to apply force horizontally. And, and horizontal force, as I'll allude to later in the presentation, is a really key determinant in high speed running and the ability to, to generate a lot of force in the ground and, and move and accelerate. We know all about weak glute muscles and, and how reduced activation uh, you know, elevates the demands placed on the hamstrings due to the large hip extension torque while sprinting. So when we, when we talk about the kinetic chain in summary, we do a lot of hip and core exercises. Uh, we make sure that the hip is moving really well uh, and, and try to open it up anteriorly. And, and we focus a lot on the, on the glute exercises. So just showing two things here, uh, we really go to, uh, you know, hip thruster type exercises. Um, you know, we go single leg, we go double leg. And then maybe even a, a regression from that is just doing an elevated heel bridge um, where they'll just kind of squeeze their glutes and kind of elevate, keeping their core tight. Very basic stuff, but this is all stuff you can start very early on. Um, you know, even though the hip thruster is loaded, there's very, very little stress we're putting on the actual hamstring there. Uh, and the athletes seem to tolerate it really well. So we also look at a combination of hip and knee dominant exercises. Uh, we know that the knee dominant exercises are beneficial for loading the distal hamstring. Uh, and we know that the knee flexion exercises have been better at developing the semitendinosus and biceps femoris short head. So um, while we know that, and it's probably a review for most of us, uh, the takeaway message here is that I think we need to start treating hamstring strains individually by based on, um, you know, what muscles are being affected. I don't think there's a one size fits all approach anymore as we start to get more uh, data on, you know, the proper exercise for proper muscle recruitment and proper activation and what MRIs look like. Um, I think we could start to tailor some of these uh, rehabilitation protocols more towards the specific muscles that are involved. So we tend to start um, isometrics at multi angles uh, very early in the process, as long as there's minimal pain. Um, so you see Phil there doing it at 0 0.45 and then, and then again at 90 degrees. Um, and then we'll also use uh, obviously some uh, uh, some knee dominant knee flexor exercises um, where we're just doing some really light hamstring curls across a full range of motion, uh, focusing on obviously the eccentric lowering. Uh, my next slide actually shows a little bit more on the, on the hamstring curl machine. That's a, a Kaiser hamstring curl. And I think that has a lot of benefits to, to being used in, in some of our programs. So the picture or, or the video on the left, you're gonna see almost like a hamstring tantrum where we can really start to focus on some of these knee dominant exercises at higher speeds, uh, which we hope to try to uh, mimic more of the demands that, that players see on the field. Obviously, those are not real length and state higher speeds, but, but again, they are moving uh, at higher speeds than they normally would of, of a standard hamstring curl. The second video on the right, again, is the, is the Kaiser hamstring curl. What we're doing is we're going up with two and we're loading um, you know, on the way down with, with, with two as well. So, what we do is we have them go quickly concentrically up and then we really load the hamstrings by adding more weight to the Kaiser machine. Um, and then when they get to the bottom, we can take the load off and then prepare them for the next concentric rep. When again, we bring them to the top, we load them with a bunch of air, have them slowly lower it and then pull the weight off for the concentric. So we really can focus more on the eccentric contraction here uh, with some of the pneumatic resistance equipment, which has been a real nice benefit for us. So when you talk about hip dominant exercises, obviously they're better for, the, for loading the proximal hamstring. 
Um, we know that previous research has demonstrated higher levels of biceps femoris long head and semimembranosus activity and hypertrophy um, during hip extension oriented movements. We think there are greater uh, rehabilitation implications with hip extension mo uh, movements um, because they, they more mimic the muscle lengths that, that the athletes are seeing during sport. And this is really related to the greater la lateral activation uh, due to greater uh, moment arm. So I know we all use RDLs in our, in our, with our athletes now. I think um, from, a, from an RDL standpoint, we tend to start really early. So even uh, shortly after injury, we start getting them to think about hip hinging. We get them to start thinking about um, you know, some hip airplanes or some tippy twister exercises, anything to really start to promote some longer length hamstring exercises uh, early on in the process. On the right, you'll see a, a 45 degree um, you know, back extension with some resistance. Uh, I tend to start these really early too. They appear to be real safe. Don't make the athletes real sore and they, and they tolerate them tolerate them really well. Looking at eccentrics, uh, why eccentric hamstring strength? And this has been mentioned uh, by Ryan and Kevin. Uh, we know eccentrics are well-researched. We know that there's, um, you know, they're crucial during the maximum running velocity. Uh, we know that there, uh, there's implications with that in, in injury at longer lengths. Uh, we use eccentrics obviously to increase biceps femoris long head fascicle length. Uh, as you increase fascicle length, you improve angles of peak knee flexion torque um, and improve eccentric knee flexor strength. Um, from some of the research coming out of the AFL in, in Australia, we know that short fascicle length of the biceps femoris uh, made the athletes a fourfold greater risk for injury compared to those athletes with longer fascicle length. Um, again, increasing the fascicle length will shift the angles of peak, peak torque to longer muscle lengths, which, which are implicated in injury. Um, personally, we've used kind of 10% as a benchmark uh, when comparing to the uh, contralateral limb. And there obviously have been some um, you know, rehabilitation programs uh, described in the literature that have shown that eccentric exercises have been more effective than conventional exercise uh, in relation to a faster return to play and reduction of injury. And this is a lot of asking, Askin's work. So why the Nordic? Uh, a lot of Nordic exercise has been um, published in literature with, with varying um, you know, injury reductions from 50 to 70%. Uh, although the, the Nordic itself uh, recruits preferentially the semitendinosus, it does have a huge amount of EMG activation of the bicep femoris. Um, we know that the Nordic does a really nice job of increasing fascicle length of the bicep femoris. And this is some of David Opar's work out of Australian Catholic University. Um, the problem with the Nordic hamstring exercise is it kind of gets a bad rap uh, and, and compliance is sometimes an issue. Um, the literature about the volume of this exercise is kind of all over the map. Um, you know, anything from two to four exercise or two to four reps a session to three to 12. So there, there's really little um, consensus among how much is too much in the dosing of this exercise. With the Giants, we tend to use it as a, as a screen. Um, we, we build it into their workout program. So instead of just doing a Nordic hamstring on the mat, we put them on the Nord board and, and, and we kind of get the data that way. Uh, and we, we tend to do two sets of two, two sets of three. That seems to be our, uh, an optimal dosing for our population. So this is a video of the Nord board. The ankles are hooked into the, to the uh, device here. Uh, the coach is slowly going down. Maybe he's cheating a little bit by getting a little bit of trunk flexion. And on, and on the right, what you'll see is the graph demonstrating left and right uh, force production. And then the bottom graph shows asymmetry. So we'll use this data. Um, to chart over time, we'll use it from a, a, a rehabilitation and, and benchmarking standpoint. We'll use it to identify those players who may have some deficiencies from previous hamstring strain. Um, but again, more of the story is that we do include Nordics in our, in our, uh, in our post uh, or our primary and secondary prevention, uh, as well as rehabilitation programming. We've also used a lot of Tim Tyler's work, uh, and I know there's a comment about that on, on the side, uh, and, and his work has demonstrated that uh, rehabilitation programs that utilize eccentric exercise at long muscle lengths um, were, were really good in, in restoring pre-injury hamstring strength throughout the range of motion and, and helped reduce injury or re-injury basically down to zero. So while we don't have a biodex. Um, we'll do this using a Kaiser, a, a free motion apparatus. We'll have the, the athlete's ankle hooked into the, into the, to the rope there. Um, the, the clinician will help uh, bring the heel down to the butt and then the, uh, the athlete will have to kind of fight the resistance. And we use this kind of pretty, uh, pretty early in the process, as long as their pain isn't too much, you know, kind of two, three, we think that's acceptable. Uh, and this is a nice, simple, uh, safe way to kind of introduce, um, you know, long muscle length activity. 
We've also used some uh, variations of rubber band pull downs, uh, looking at the muscle at, at, at long length, uh, maybe a little bit more related to the lengths that the player sees in sprinting. And then on the right hand side, you're seeing some manual um, length and state eccentrics. Again, we, we can start these on the table before we progress them, um, but uh, trying, to, trying to get in some type of length and state eccentric we think is beneficial for rehab. Talking about building resiliency to fatigue, we know that fatigue causes altered activation patterns. We know that at the end of swing phase, uh, the hamstring acts isometrically. Um, so we tend to use isometric training to improve fatigue resistance. Uh, top video is the Roman chair hold. Uh, there's been some, some recent data on this that, it, that it, uh, increasing hamstring muscle endurance uh, and it actually increases endurance more than, say, the Nordic curl would. And then we'll just do some isometric glute holds here where, you know, we'll give them 30 seconds and they really got to fight uh, against gravity to kind of keep their butt up. Um, again, just trying to build resistance, or I'm sorry, build resiliency to fatigue uh, throughout the posterior chain. I think one thing that gets forgotten is this horizontal ground reaction force. Um, we know that high amounts of horizontal ground reaction force is a strong predictor of acceleration and sprint performance. And that's really forward propulsion. And, and really that's what our athletes do on a daily basis. Their job is to put their foot in the ground and generate as much force in as quick an amount of time as possible um, to either run the route or, or um, you know, to sprint. So we know that the highest levels of ground reaction force are those uh, those individuals who can produce the highest capabilities of their hip extensors and have the highest EMG during the end swing phase uh, during spring acceleration. So why is this important? It's important because there's been some data that shows that there have been alterations in hip, in horizontal ground reaction force in athletes recovering uh, from hamstring strain. Um, so almost 13% difference in players that have had a previous hamstring strain. Uh, so again, what does that lead to? That, that that's a product of weak hip extension. That's a product of reduced knee flexion function. Um, and this is what's causing these. So we tend to use, uh-oh, sorry. So we tend to use uh, the Woodway force here. Um, it's a measure of, um, it's an instrument assisted, it's an instrument assisted treadmill here. You could look at left and right asymmetries. Um, and, and, and if you don't have one of these force treadmills or OptiGates or any of those, um, you know, the high tech stuff, I think anytime you can build in some horizontal ground reaction force activities, so whether it's plyometrics or foot contacts or bounding or bounding into an acceleration, um, understanding that horizontal ground reaction force is altered um, and maybe eliminated in players uh, coming back from hamstring strain uh, and, and kind of doing your part as, as the clinician to, to improve this, knowing that the deficit may be there. So you can also use this as a, as a baseline measure. Uh, you put healthy subjects on there, get to see what their asymmetry is, and then you can do it again at various points during the, um, during the rehabilitation process. I think one thing that often gets forgotten is this maintenance of so loading. We know that our, our job as rehab clinicians is really to expose the athletes to appropriate loads during the rehab process so they don't experience that spike when they get back to practice. So whatever we can do on, a, on the field, um, we tend to do to, to try to, to um, really keep their loading up. So when they get back to the field um, and they were doing 5,000 yards, now they're not going from zero yards back to 5,000 yards. So even if it's 500 yards of sled pulls, um, you know, forwards and backwards, lateral shuffles, uh, lateral band walks, we're trying to acquire and accumulate as much yardage as we can during the rehab process so that when they go back, they're not, um, you know, more likely to get hurt again due to low chronic workload. So we'll also do a, a variety of different field work. We'll do some straight leg skips. Um, we can do some you know, high knees um, or some ace skips there. We can do some ankling and we can do some butt kicks. So again, what, what our session could look like, it could be 500 yards of sled pulls. It could be you know, um, followed by 500 yards of ace skips. And we just really try to build load in a pain-free range of motion. And these are all pretty remedial exercises that, that the athlete can do um, without really exacerbating their hamstring strain. I think one of the big things that, that you need to do in, in rehabilitation and returning a player back to play uh, is really track. And, and we, take the, we take into account every step that every step counts. So fortunately, we have the ability to work, look at GPS and, and accelerometer data. Uh, we look at workloads and high-speed runnings and max velocities and, and sprint distances and how many 
sprint efforts they had, excels and decels. Um, there's a recent Delphi study that that 82% of experts in, in in European soccer believe that rehabilitation programs should follow some type of GPS targeted match specific progression. Um, we know that achieving peak speed or near speed or near peak speed in training uh, is associated with the, with lower risk of hamstring injury. So it's kind of a it's kind of a paradoxical. We know that high speed running can strain hamstrings, but we know that high speed running is is injury protective uh, from primary injury and secondary. So of all the things uh, we talk about on rehab and return to play, one of the most predictive things in, in appropriate and, and reduction of re-injury is high, sp high sprint running loads. So sprint distances accumulated in rehabilitation were found to be protective and related to subsequent re-injury risk. So all the strengthening is great, but at the end of the day, you need to get your athletes out there running at the speeds they're running uh, during games and during competition and during practice not only hitting max speed, but acquiring enough sprint distance um, to, to really match what they're doing on the field in, in uh, pre-injury levels. Unfortunately, the research has demonstrated that to hit these milestones, rehab often takes longer. Um, so, so you're really dealing with kind of that catch-22 uh, and, and trade-off between, well, you know, they may be out a little longer, but on the back end, you may be able to prevent re-injury down the road. And finally, establishing a return to play continuum. Ours kind of looks like uh, this will put them in no contact, co controlled contact, full contact. We can modify their rep percentages. Um, we do that nicely using GPS technology or, or even telling their position coach, hey, let's only have them run three out of six reps in this period. Um, we can limit some of their participation in the, in the periods themselves. So we, we've noticed that individual periods have a high level of, of activity um, versus some of the other periods of practice. Maybe we only want to put them in one-on-ones. In Maybe we want to hold them out of one-on-ones. Maybe we want to take them out of team. So really taking a systematic approach to reintegration to activity uh, is, is part of the rehab process as well. So I know this is kind of beyond the scope of what, what the, the talk is for the day, but I kind of wanted to give you our return to consideration, uh, para uh, return to competition considerations, uh, pain-free at rest with activity, symmetry with straight leg raise. We, we have them obtain maximum speed or near maximum speed. We have them acquire much high-speed running distance as they can. Um, we make sure they're, they're prepared and they're confident. Uh, we do a GPS-based progression for them. We look at horizontal limb symmetry, horizontal force limb symmetry, and we make sure their eccentric hamstring strength is, is, is really strong. So in closing, I think I just threw this slide in there uh, because nutrition is a huge aspect of this. I stole this from our nutritionist. But just know that we consider nutrition, you know, part of the injury prevention and rehabilitation program, whether it's increasing their protein needs, giving them some anti-inflammatory, um, anti-inflammatory, you know, nutritious foods such as nitrates or, or tart cherry juice, uh, increasing their omega-3 you know, intake, creatine supplement, supplementation, some of their vitamin D. So what about BFR? There's no direct studies that link BFR with uh, improving hamstring strains and, and hamstring strains post-injury. I think it's inferential where you know, mechanisms of action include, you know, differentiation of satellite cells, downregulation of myostatin, reduction of pain, uh, recruitment of fast twitch fibers. So the moral of the story for me is, yes, we use BFR. B2, uh, there's really no science behind it um, besides some of the inferential basic science. I believe that if you can load the tissue, load the tissue, and then you may not need BFR in the first place. And I think Johnny Owens would, would kind of support that as well. Uh, a word about re-injury. Re-injury is a real problem in the NFL. Uh, anywhere from 17 to 25 percent. Uh, there's a high rate of recurrence within the first four weeks, uh, and that's kind of just what the research shows. Um, so why maybe the, the scar isn't as strong, maybe the architectural changes of the bicep femoris and some of the fascial shortenings. Uh, Ryan or, or Kevin mentioned the, the changes in neuromuscular activation and firing patterns, and there, there is some atrophy post-injury, um, which, uh, which we need to address as well from a rehab standpoint. So this is a real issue, and, and to, in my opinion, this falls on our shoulders. Um, you know, secondary prevention on the basis of good, sound rehabilitation and return to play continuums, uh, you know, falls on the shoulders of everyone in this room, and, and therefore it's on us to kind of reduce those numbers and to really deliver, you know, a, a program that can prevent re-injury down the road for these players. Uh, Take-home messages, I think we need more data, uh, you know, clinically practical data. You know, there's been some research on early versus delayed rehab. Uh, early rehab shorten the return to play time without the risk, the, the risk of the risk of increased or increased injury. And then a recent study on pain-free versus pain threshold um, did not result in greater recoveries of isometric knee strength, 
um, or I'm sorry, did not accelerate return to play, but did result in better isometric knee flexor strength and, and maintenance of biceps femoris long head length, which kind of which kind of leads us to well maybe pain threshold rehab is, is the way to go. And this is just an infographic I stole from uh, Aidan Oakley uh, from the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Kind of talks about holistic hamstring strength. And, and rehab should be a continuum of all these items, whether it's strength, overload, uh, flexibility, mobility, addressing risk factors, and, and all the running metrics. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Vian, for, for letting me present here. Uh, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, this is a real uh, you know, pet project of mine, kind of you know, looking at hamstring strains and knowing this can make a big difference, not only in our athletes in the NFL, but really across, um, you know, across sports in general. Thanks, Lee. That was awesome. Um, appreciate your time. Uh, one question, I actually have two. Um, one's very specific. The first being, um, is there anything manual therapy wise that you do to address that anterior capsule tightness? Um, anything that you found to be particularly effective? Yeah, so we'll use, um, we'll use belt modes, um, you know, kind of open up the anterior capsule. We'll use a, a lot of super band mobility that the athletes can actually do on their own. You know, you hook the super band into you know, a rack or something, and they kind of use um, use the band to, to open up their anterior hip capsule. Those have really been our go-tos. Um, we've been doing more and more nerve glides. Uh, you know, we think not necessarily for the anterior hip capsule, but kind of promoting muscle length uh, and making sure the, the nerve is moving correctly because we, we see a lot of, um, I don't know if we see a lot of it, but uh, we think that may contribute to some of these players who, who take a while to get a straight leg raise back or, or get a 90-90 hamstring length, you know, their, their length back. So, we use that as well. Um, the second one is um, when you have an athlete, um, like an O line or D line, might get placed in an awkward position and have more of a stretching type injury. What are the big differences that you see or have to install in your rehab because of that? Yeah, so so the majority of the ones we see are these kind of long lever uh, sprinting hamstring injuries sustained in skill position players. Now we will see some that are that occur in deceleration. Um, where a player's got to put his foot in the ground, change direction. Um, and then we'll also see those that are related to traumatic. So, for example, um, if, you, if you could visualize a field goal and, and you have the offensive line lined up and maybe the defensive player or the, um, the, the field goal block team, you know, goes into an individual's knee who gets hyperextended and then flexed at the hip. Um, so, so first you kind of count your blessings that they didn't sublux their hip and, and you know, break their acetabulum. Um, and those may tend to take a little longer, those ones that are kind of contact related. We often, we don't get very many of them, which is, which is good. The ones we've had uh, do take longer. Uh, we've seen kind of more injury. We see the proximal ones kind of take a little longer. Um, we've also seen the distal ones take a little longer. So those that kind of are involved with the tendon, uh, we've seen kind of protracted recovery. Um, but, uh, and, and, and kind of different skill sets. So the offensive linemen, those that kind of get hurt in a, in a contact nature, um, you really focus on more stability with them and not as much high speed running and, and, and those type of things you'd normally do in rehab. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else have any uh, questions? I know we've obviously uh, ran long today, but I, th I thought it was extremely um, worthwhile and uh, just really fortunate to have Lee and Kevin on. Um, nobody has any questions. I uh, will. We'll go ahead and we can end and I uh, hope to see you or the majority of you at 10 o'clock next week um, to kind of discuss a little bit more return to play phases for these types of injuries in depth. Um, big thanks to Kevin and Lee for being on and uh, thanks again everybody for your time today. Hey uh, Ryan, yeah. you might want to hold on. I think, I think uh, somebody had a yeah. comment. No. I had a question. Um, this is Brett, a uh, physical therapist at Duke. Um, first, just wanted to say thanks for getting this together. Um, this has been great. Um, one of my questions that I have is just um, some of the thoughts on the mechanism of why Nordics um, tend to be really, really effective. Um, and I guess my question is, is that obviously it's a heavy, heavy eccentric um, load to the tissue. Um, however, most of it's done in a really, really poor uh, core position. I mean, I don't know anybody that does that in a nice, um, like neutral pelvis position. And so, you know, we work heavily on um, eccentric strength and eccentric loading, but we also work heavily on um, trying to get people to have a better core position and better mechanics when they're running. And I was just wondering other people's thoughts on 
maybe what the mechanism is of Nordics um, and um, how that how those two kind of uh, match up or don't match up in their minds when prescribing that exercise. It's a great question. I mean, I, I don't necessarily know the answer to it. I think uh, you're right, though. We do see we do see a lot of people tend to cheat on the Nordic with this kind of flexed um, this kind of flexed hip posture. We try to correct it the best we can. Um, I think the the mechanism for the Nordics. I think you hit you know you hit the nail on the head. I think it's related to the strength of the contraction in, in my opinion. And, um, just just versus where the where the ankles are fixed and, and you're kind of getting the length. Uh, from the exercise. I think that, to me, that's the mechanism. I, I wonder if it has something to do with the, the, the thought that it's neuromuscularly, it's a failure, right? Everybody collapses at some point in the Nordic. So just to prepare the nervous system and the muscle tissue to essentially have an eccentric load that the body can't handle um, I just wonder if it has something to do with that neuromuscular control, but it, I mean, it is a good point that a lot of people do get that anterior torso lean with that, um, especially individuals that maybe have higher muscle tissue um, up above that you might see typical of a football player. So it's definitely a very interesting point. <laughs> hey, uh, Lee, this is, uh, this is Kerry at Duke. Um, Great job, really interesting stuff. Uh, great job by by everyone, Kevin and, and Ryan as well. Um, I thought your point is, and you, that you seem to emphasize <clears throat> quite a bit, was the re, was the sprinting component and the high speed work, um, which I agree with a, a lot. I think um, I think sometimes the challenge is getting getting others to agree with that, and that and that enough is already being done during a drill or that type of thing. Um, so I just wondered if, and I know obviously your GPS work, uh, I'm sure helps with that, getting your point across. Can you maybe speak to those that don't have that capability on, on some tips or pearls uh, of just the, the politics of communication and, um, philosophy and, and getting that point across and that high speed running enough volume of sprint work and, and the importance of that. Yeah, you, you know, you bring up a great point. And, and we talk uh, a lot about, you know, the ideal rehab program and the ideal training program. But at the end of the day, you know, you got to get a player on the field because because they got to play, they got to play football, they got to play baseball, they got to play basketball. So, you know, the sports medicine side of this always kind of, you know, throws a wrench and even even the best laid plans. Um, I think, I think technologically, um, there have been a lot of advances the last five years. Uh, you know, you no longer need the the heavy duty GPS program. Uh, you know, wearable garments. You can you can use the you know, the Garmin watches, the Apple watches. Um, there there's so many retail based um, you know devices now that, that polar heart pol polar watches uh, do GPS. So there's so many different uh, retail based items now you can buy to kind of get that information. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot internally um, about wellness questionnaires and, and understanding a player's wellness questionnaire and giving them a questionnaire every day may have greater insight into, the, into how they're doing on a daily basis in some GPS numbers. Um, and then taking that and multiplying it by the, their RPE um, or, or some of the time they spent on the field. Uh, you know, it, it is a balance. It's, it's tough to have those conversations about high speed running. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's ever a hamstring strain that, that we returned to play where the first two or three weeks, you didn't worry about, oh man, I hope this guy's able to stay out there. You know, you just, as clinicians, you just always have that kind of angst that, well, I hope he did enough high speed running. Um, you know, I think, I think from an NFL perspective, uh, you know, we're educating our, our coaches now more than ever about high speed running. We're educating them now about load management and, and matching the demands of games and practice. And um, we're running data and, and we're showing data about, um, what does optimal practice timing look like and how many practices in a row? And, and um, you know, maybe we start with, uh, maybe we start with red zone and goal line the first two days of practice instead of doing one-on-ones and, and uh, you know, third down yardage. So, so we're really kind of, the coaches are interested because they know, 
that teams with the most player availability usually usually the most successful. So we've really got their ear on a lot of these different uh, metrics now. So it's been it's been really encouraging, really promising. Great, thank you. Um, just one other, uh, I guess, thing I would maybe mention that I, I texted or put it in the chat is um, kind of to that to that point. Uh, for those of you that have a pool, uh, I would encourage that early on uh, get them in the pool. You can do a lot of your your running and gate mechanics, um, even eccentrics. You know, with your uh, your your uh, kind of a swing through and a stop kick uh, in the pool. And so um, I think that's a great adjunct to use for those that have it. Uh, and then the other comment I had was, I think Kevin, you talked about, you know, progression and how do we, how do we progress criteria or whatnot? Um, oh, my computer's about to run out. Uh, is another thing that I will um, use is just, just kind of a soreness rules in that, um, um, you know, depending on, we want them to get sore and, and we want to keep it minimal pain, but but how sore are they the, the next day? You know, and, and are they hurting versus, uh, you know, I had a good workout, I'm sore appropriately. And I think that's a good way, to, uh, another good, just, um, you know, it's not rocket science, but something to consider to gauge your progressions. I, Thanks, I, you guys. I agree with what you, I agree with that. The pool is a great, um, you know, a great tool. The Ultra G is a great tool to kind of get these guys running again. Um, and then we tend to look at, uh, we'll look at swelling day to day too. So we'll have them do a resisted, you know, knee flexion. And we'll kind of compare side to side just to see if they're if they're one muscles in focus versus the other. So we we'll use that as a benchmark. You know, pain to palpation, um, you know, uh, pain to palpation, swelling, how they feel the next day. I mean, all those are, are great benchmarkers to to really determine whether or not to progress to the next level. Any last minute questions, anybody? All right, well, perfect. Thank you guys uh, for being on and Big thanks to Lee and Kevin again. Uh, really appreciate everybody's time this morning and uh, look forward again to meeting next week. Um, we'll, we'll either send out an email with the outline Monday or Tuesday, depending on how far along we get with this. It is kind of a week to week thing right now, um, but expect to hear no later than probably Wednesday night with either the link and just what we'll be presenting on that uh, this upcoming Friday at 10. Um, so stay safe everybody. Um, thanks again for all your time and uh, take care.